cool. Now we're in our study here. Uh, and I'm, we're going to try something. This is a, a study that has been on my heart for a while. I, I don't know how it's going to go. It's essentially a life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and, and it's an interesting uh, study, obviously, uh, but uh, kind of difficult because you don't really have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, chronological information about Paul, and you have to piece it together. So we'll just see how this goes. I- I'm pretty excited about it uh, because, you know, if the church is a building constructed on the foundation of Jesus Christ, then Paul would be one of its primary architects. Uh, he made three long missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire, planting churches where there were no churches. Think, imagine that. Paul would go into an area where people had never heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he would establish churches, and he would leave, and there would be a thriving ministry behind him. Uh, and then he would give strength and encouragement to other Christians that were popping up in churches everywhere. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, Paul is the author of 13 of them. Now, technically... Uh, Luke wrote most of the New Testament because he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. So when people say who wrote more, the most in the New Testament, it's, the, it's, it's Dr. Luke. But for sheer volume of number of epistles, uh, Paul, 13 of the 27 books. He didn't just impact the church. One writer said, and I quote, it may be impossible to overstate Paul's impact on Western civilization. Uh, He obviously had a tremendous impact on the church and on civilization itself. His life is so filled with action and his words so flowing with doctrine, we rarely take time to look at the man himself. What I want to do in this series, take a look at the man in what might be termed a harmony of the life of St. Paul. And I'm indebted to a guy by the name of Frank Goodwin. Uh, who compiled just such a harmony and published it with that title. It's a, it's a good book. You can pick it up. It's available on Kindle or in regular book form. Uh, and uh, all it is is he'll, he parses Paul's life into different segments, and then he finds a scripture that describes those various segments. Starts with the book of Acts, if there's a historical note, and then different things that Paul said about himself in the various epistles. So it's very fascinating. What we're going to do then is blend the accounts of Paul in the book of Acts with certain historical and autobiographical portions in his letters, and uh, we'll read the verses pertinent to a time or event in Paul's life, and then we'll try and put them into perspective. And of course, we always want to see ourselves in the Word, or, or I should say we want to see how God works to make a man or a woman of God. The, the real value to these life of studies, you know, wh- whether you're doing the life of David or the life of Abraham or the life of any Bible character, is that you see how God works uh, in a man or in a woman to make a man or a woman of God because he's, uh, the, you know, he's still that master potter working with us as his clay and uh, he has certain ways of working with that clay. And, and though we may not be a Paul the Apostle or an Abraham or a David, uh, God is working with us just the same way uh, and just as wonderfully. Now, a good place to begin is with Paul's ancestry. Uh, so just listen as I reference and then read some verses that we can string together that tell us a little bit about where Paul comes from. In Acts twenty one thirty nine. Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a city, uh, a citizen of no mean city. And then in Acts 22, 3, he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, zealous toward God. Uh, Acts 23, 34, when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from, and he understood that he was from Cilicia. 2 Corinthians 11.22, Paul says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Romans 11.1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And then in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, he says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh... If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee. Now, there's a lot we could focus on, but uh, when you think about Paul's ancestry, where he came from, two things seem to rise to the top when he talks about himself 
uh, or he's talked about in the book of Acts. Number one, he was a Jew, obviously, but he says more than that. He says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and we'll talk about that. And he was also quite proud of his Roman citizenship and his being a resident of the city of Tarsus, or at least he mentioned it on several occasions. Now, among Jews, his name was Saul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, who was the brother of Joseph, specially loved by Jacob since Rachel died after giving birth to him. His name, Saul, came from the most famous Benjamite, Israel's first king. Now, you and I, we read the life of uh, Saul and we think, man, that guy was a loser. Uh, but he was, a f- he was the most famous Benjamite. Uh, even though he didn't really finish well, he was uh, well thought of uh, in Jewish circles. Uh, and, um, you know, it wasn't like naming somebody Judas would be. You know, you don't find too many Judases anymore. Uh, and, and there's a good, good reason for that. But uh, so Saul, very proud of that name most famous Benjamite. It was believed he was born somewhere between 5 B.C. and 4 A.D. We don't have a birthday for Paul, but somewhere during that time. So that makes him a contemporary of Jesus, about the same age, really. At least seven of Paul's relatives are mentioned in the New Testament. At the end of his letter to the Romans, Paul greets as relatives Andronicus and Junia, Jason, Sosipater, and Lucius. In addition, the book of Acts mentions Paul's sister and his nephew who actually helped Paul when he was in prison by exposing a plot that was against him. And so there are some references to relatives that Paul had uh, in the text. Paul was what scholars call a dispersion Jew. The diaspora is the English term used to describe the scattering of the Jews from their promised land. The diaspora began with the 6th century B.C. conquest of Judah, the destruction of the first temple, and the expulsion of the population. That's what we're reading about now on Sunday mornings as we go through the book of Jeremiah, that time period when God brought judgment against his people because of their gross sin and idolatry, and they were dispersed from the promised land out into the world. The Babylonian ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, allowed them to remain unified as a community in Babylon. Another group of Jews fled to Egypt, where they settled in the Nile Delta. That group actually took Jeremiah with them. And there were a few Jews who stayed back uh, in uh, Judah. From 597 B.C. onwards, there were three distinct groups of Hebrews or Jews in the world, a group in Babylon and other parts of the Middle East, a group in Judea, and then another group in Egypt. Cyrus the Persian uh, allowed the Jews to return to their homeland in 538 B.C., the Persians having conquered the Babylonian Empire, but most of the Jews chose to remain in Babylon. In a world Jewish population estimated at from 3 to 8 million uh, in the first century, about two-thirds of the Jews lived outside of the Holy Land. Uh, And so most Jews lived in other portions of the Roman Empire. Now, to his Israelite heritage, Paul added the further detail. He said, I am a Hebrew born of Hebrews. And this is actually a specialized term. All Hebrews were Jews, but not all Jews were Hebrews. Some Jews were what were called Hellenists. Now, the conquest of Alexander the Great in the late 4th century B.C. spread Greek culture and colonization. And this process of cultural change, they called Hellenization. Uh, They wanted to make everybody Grecian. The aim was to establish a single culture among diverse people. To be a Hellenist, therefore, meant you spoke Greek and you adopted the ways of the Greek culture. Uh, And so it was kind of an immersion thing where uh, you might be a Jew, you might be an Italian, you might be whatever, but they were trying to get everybody on the same page, as it were, speaking the same language, sharing in the same culture, and this was called Hellenization. Some Jews embraced Hellenism, others, more Orthodox, did not. They were called Hebrews. Now, the Hebrews attended synagogues where the scriptures were read and the prayers were offered in Hebrew, and they used Aramaic, not Greek, as their daily language. And so they wanted to retain 
uh, their own unique Jewish identity within the Greek culture. The Hellenists spoke Greek and their synagogue services were held in Greek. Uh, and you might remember that one of the first disputes in the early church w- was between the caring of widows, uh, between the Hellenist widows and the other widows because they weren't being treated fairly. And that's when the apostles had to get together and say, we don't wait tables, pick some deacons to take care of that for you. And so this was a, this was a distinction between Hebrews and Hellenists. A Jew born in a city like Tarsus would be assumed to be a Hellenist, uh, but Paul was not. He was raised in a strict home, observant of the Jewish way of life that maintained a cultural connection with Jerusalem. Now, this Hebrew of Hebrews, having said all that, he was also quite the Roman citizen. Paul is not the Roman or the Greek equivalent of Saul. Uh, I may have even said this sometime in my life, and you may have heard this, that Saul is his Jewish name and Paul is his Roman name. That part is true, but there, it's not like, you know, when I was taking Spanish and they said my Spanish name was Eugenio, you know, which it isn't because I'm not Eugene, I'm just Gene. Uh, but you know what I mean? So, it, it, so Paul and Saul aren't linguistic equivalents. They are two separate names. Uh, and he didn't change his name from, Paul, uh, from Saul to Paul after his dramatic conversion. Paul was Paul's given Roman name. It's likely he had both of these names from birth. It was the practice, even among the Hebrews, to have a Roman name to celebrate Roman heritage and another name to celebrate your ethnic heritage. It's kind of a, a funny story, but when I was born... Uh, back in Stamford, Connecticut, which is a hotbed of Catholic Italian activity, uh, they literally would not let me leave the hospital without being named after a saint. Uh, And and so uh, by the time they got to me, they had already named my brother Anthony after my paternal grandfather and my brother Richard after my maternal grandfather, so it was my turn to be named after my dad. But he wanted us to be more English, so instead of Gennaro, I was just named Jean. And the nuns, the story is told to me, refused to release me uh, until I had the name of a saint in there somewhere as well. And so my middle name is Joseph. Uh, and so that's how I got, that's how I got my middle name uh, and stuff. And so, but so, you know, people do kind of crazy, weird stuff like that. Little, my son, Gene, got his name because we thought he was going to be a girl and we had no girl names picked out. And so we just saddled him with my name. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, as long as we're being honest. I feel like I've taken honest pills here and stuff. But anyway, so Paul would have, so this would be Paul Saul of Tarsus. And so these were two separate names. He didn't change his name. He didn't quit using one over the other. Obviously, he was known as Saul among Jews more, Paul among the Romans, but those were his names. Names. He would have received the name Saul on the eighth day after his birth at his circumcision. That's when Jewish children would be named or, or their name would be given. Tarsus, capital city of the province of Cilicia, located in what is modern-day Turkey on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you know, I, I, I must not have been paying attention in school. Because I, this is just a fallacy I have. You probably don't do this because you're a highly educated and trained individuals. Whenever I think of the Roman Empire, I only think of Italy and the city of Rome. I, I, don't, I have no comprehension that the Roman Empire spanned vast areas. And when I read something like Tarsus is the capital city and, and it was in modern day Turkey, I don't think I can even find Turkey on a map today. But uh, so the Roman Empire was a big thing, and uh, Tarsus was in Turkey on the Mediterranean Sea. It was a city that was called Libera Civitas, which means it was a free city, and such that a standing gave the city to right to govern itself. Not all Roman cities had the right to govern themselves. About a half a million people lived in Tarsus. It was. Uh, the size of Fresno. I don't know uh, the land area, but there were a lot of people there. And it was a port city with a natural and well-protected harbor. So there was a lot of uh, travel, a lot of trade. It was a vacation spot. It was a big deal. The prosperity of Tarsus was based on flax, which they grew. But reference is also made in history text to a local material called Cilicium. It was woven from goat's hair, from which were made coverings 
that were designed to be waterproof. According to one source, and I quote, the black tents of Tarsus were used by caravans, nomads, and armies all over Asia Minor and Syria. And so when we talk about Paul, and you know most of you that he had as a trade, a tent maker, we're talking about him engaged in the manufacturing of goods made of this woven Cilicium. Many tents, awnings, those kinds of things, and it was, it was really very popular in the Roman Empire, uh, and, and um, it was, these people were noted for it. Now, Tarsus was also a university town boasting great wisdom. Teachers from all over the Roman Empire came to Tarsus as guest lecturers. Paul was a citizen, he says, of Tarsus. Citizenship was rare in the Roman Empire. Roman citizenship was originally confined to free-born natives of the city of Rome. It wasn't just anybody born in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, I'm learning, is vast and diverse, free cities, not so free cities, some governed in different ways. And at first, in order to be a Roman citizen, you had to be a free-born natural citizen of, or naturally born in the city of Rome itself. Later, it could be conferred upon others who were not born there for various things. And eventually, we learn that it could be purchased, but at great cost. Paul has an encounter with, I think his name is Lysias in the book of Acts, and he says, I'm a Roman citizen. And Lysias says, so am I. I bought my citizenship at a great price. And Paul says, I'm a free-born Roman citizen, nanny, nanny, you know, and stuff. So, but I want you to get the idea that being a citizen wasn't just a big privilege, it was. It was a huge privilege. Most Romans, most people in the Roman Empire, first of all, most of them were slaves, but even among the free population, there were very few actual Roman citizens. Being a Roman citizen had its privileges. A Roman citizen could not be condemned or punished without a fair hearing. That was a right ordinary people did not possess in Rome. He could not be scourged, which is the reason Paul escaped a beating in Acts chapter 22. And a Roman citizen could always appeal his case to the emperor if he felt he was not being treated fairly. And so these are three very significant rules and privileges of a citizen that will play into Paul's life later on. How could you prove you were a citizen? Do you ever think about that? Because it was a capital offense to claim to be a Roman citizen and not be one. And so if you couldn't prove it at some point, uh, you would be put to death. Well, there was something called a diptych, D-I-P-T-Y-C-H, and it's pronounced diptych. It's described as a pair of folding wax tablets that contained a certified copy of your birth registration. It was analogous to a passport. How Paul didn't lose this in the shipwrecks he was in is beyond me, but at any rate, he could prove he was a citizen. Now, he never does. You know, we never, there's not a a verse that says, and here's my diptych, but uh, there were times Paul said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, and uh, if you were a sharp magistrate, you would say, you need to prove that. You need to prove that. I mean, when we travel abroad, we don't say, hey, I lost my passport, but I'm sure it's okay. You're just going to let me back in, right? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. You need that thing. We're always freaked out. There's a lot of countries we've been to on missions trips where when you get there, they collect your passport and they hold on to it. And you think, this is it. I'll never see my family and friends again. I'm going to have to be smuggled across the border and swim the, you know, the Indian Ocean or something like that. And, uh, I mean, your passport, I mean, it's, it's a real thing that you hang on to. And so Paul maybe had, uh, I assume, your birth would be registered probably, obviously, in the city where you were born, but you'd have to prove it. And so he would have this documentation. How did Paul's family acquire Roman citizenship? Well, presumably Paul's father or some other earlier relative had rendered some outstanding service to the Roman Empire. At any rate... There were but a few Roman citizens even in Tarsus, and they would have been seen as an elite group. And even fewer of them were Jews. And so that's a little bit of where Paul came from. That's his backstory. It's interesting. Paul came from a position of wealth. He came from a place of prominence. And he gives you insight into something he would say to the church at Corinth. This is 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. 
I read it a little bit differently, remembering where Paul came from. He said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the things, uh, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, Paul says God uses very few wise, mighty, or noble people according to the standards of this world. And he, in fact, was one of those wise, mighty, noble individuals at one point in his life. He, he understood firsthand how difficult it was for such a person to humble himself to be used of God. Now, the world would have you believe that the background of most people is actually a problem. Descriptors like Paul gave there as foolish, weak, base, and despised are thought to be demeaning. Um, I got in trouble one time when the kids, uh, I think it was, must have been little Gene was in kindergarten, and uh, I was up at Hanford Christian School helping, you know, on Parents' Day or something. And um, I hate to say this, but... Uh, some Gene asked me something or something. I don't know. It's not his fault. It's my fault. But some, somebody asked me a question, and, or, uh, and I said, well, that's just retarded. And Mrs. Bowlby took me aside and scolded me. She said, Pastor Pensiero, we do not use the word retarded anymore. And I thought, why not? It's a perfectly good word. <laughs> I didn't call anybody an MR or anything like we used to when I was in school. Did you ever do that? Call you MR. But, uh, I mean, I just thought it's retarded. I'm retarded, you know. But anyway, so I, uh, you know. So these words, they're not the nicest words to use. And Paul says God doesn't use mighty, uh, noble, uh, you know, wealthy people. He uses these kinds of people. If you come from a broken home, if you were in some way abused, if you lost a loved one at an early age, you're taught that it defines you. Our culture wants to tell you that's what defines you, even sometimes after you come to the Lord. I'm not saying that those things won't affect you. They absolutely do. But the Lord wants to transform you. He's working to conform you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. The direction to look is upward to the Lord in order to move forward with the Lord. Don't spend a lot of time looking backward. As a culture, we are obsessed with looking backward to try and, and fix things that are already under the blood of Jesus Christ. The, the Bible says that when I came to Christ, I became a new creation in Jesus Christ. I have a backstory. You have a backstory. It's tragic. It's filled with terrible things. But God is working to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ. Take a look at Jesus. He was born under socially questionable circumstances. He was thought to be illegitimate. And when the Pharisees and scribes really were backed into a corner and they didn't know what to say to Jesus, they would just accuse him of, of being an illegitimate child. It would seem that his earthly father, Joseph, died while Jesus was in his teens. Uh, he was around at, when Jesus was 12, lost at the temple, so to speak. But we don't see him after that. We just see Jesus, his mother, and his brothers. His family were poor, very poor. They lived in a village that was often slandered by others. I would say it was the Riverdale of its day, but it's, I mean, it really, we only use that for fun. I mean, Nazareth was a terrible place to be from. The wise and the mighty and the noble in our world today would recommend Jesus for therapy. If, Jesus, if, they, if he came across their desk and they said, well, what's the story on this Jesus person? <laughs> Probably an illegitimate child. Father died when he was a teen. Really a poor family. He's had to support the family as a carpenter. And he's from Nazareth. Well, we need to get this guy into therapy. What medication do you recommend? I mean, it, it, he's a basket case. And so we want to let God have our past. We want him to heal our past. It may not happen immediately, but don't ever think it won't or it can't happen without some extra help from the world. The help you need is in the word, both the written word and the living word of God. 
Jesus Christ. Now, something else we might glean from Paul's ancestry. Surrounded by Greek culture, his family, the leading citizens of Tarsus and citizens of Rome, influenced by a university intellectualism and the diversity of peoples coming to and from the port, Paul nevertheless was raised to be a strictly observant Jew, a Hebrew, not a Hellenist. We'll see next week that his upbringing was even more restricted in that he was raised to be a Pharisee the strictest sect of Judaism, and he spent time as a child in Jerusalem under the teaching of Rabbi Gamaliel. He was on the fast track to Jewish stardom. At the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian era, he was already well-known, already an established individual in the minds of the Jews. I'm sure his family was awfully proud of him right up until the time he received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior on the road to Damascus. I mean, look at all they did to ensure he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And then in a moment of time, he essentially rejected his entire way of living, which had been trying to achieve righteousness by the law for the power of grace. He exchanged all that he had learned and all that he was for the power of the grace of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It seems reasonable to assume his family rejected him. He certainly isn't portrayed as being the son and heir of a wealthy Tarsian family as we see him traveling around working with his hands to support himself as a missionary. Not that there was anything wrong with that, uh, but Paul himself, you remember, said, not many mighty or noble or wise. He had turned his back on that lifestyle uh, and um, that's why you don't read really a lot about Paul's family. We don't know. Uh, but it would seem that he was on his own. Uh, maybe your background wasn't so bad. Maybe you are one of the few who were wise and mighty or noble. It can actually be a hindrance if you're unwilling to give it up to follow Jesus Christ. There are a lot of rich young rulers in the world where Jesus, they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, what do I really need to do? And the Lord says, well, you need to be among the foolish and the weak and the despised. You need to turn your back on the world's wisdom and your understanding of what it means to have position and power and nobility and follow me. God knows where you came from. He also knows where you're going. And thus, Paul could utter the famous words in Philippians 3, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.